My name is Amanda Stevenson, and I would like to welcome you to Southeast Washington, D.C. This is Southeast Washington, D.C., the waterfront and ballpark entertainment district, the corridor of commercial and retail development, the entertainment and relaxation mecca, and D.C.'s new food hub. But wait, it's Southeast, but this is not Ward 8. If you didn't know, there are two sides of Southeast, and to get to the other side, which is Ward 8, we have to go across the Anacostia River, the body of water that separates us from and over the bridge that connects us to food and economic access and opportunities. Take a ride with me across the bridge that many travel, leaving Ward 8 for food and economic refuge. Today, I'm taking you back to the 8th Ward of Good Hope that Martin the King dreamed of on a food journey through the disparities, desires, and dreams of residents and other stakeholders. With resilience, they reimagine the broken system. As I am working to address the problem of how might we create a new and inclusive food culture to improve the health and wealth of Ward 8, where the cost of living is outpacing the incomes and life expectancies of many residents. To now realize a healthy and equitable food culture in DC, starting right here in Ward 8. Food is medicine. So does that mean food is a drug? <laughs> food is not just what we eat every day, it's our well-being. Food is medicine. Coming to DC as a college student, um, I I think I, you know, fell into the life of a college student where you don't have a lot of money and so you're eating, you know, you're eating pizza, you're eating carry out, you're eating really whatever you can um, get your hands on. And I realized um, around the age of like maybe 20, 21, that like I wasn't feeling good and I felt like I was too young to be feeling this bad. And so that's what really made me start to think about food more and what was going into my body more um, and, and caused me to change my diet um, from eating meat to being a vegetarian. Um, and then once I was a vegetarian and was living in Ward 8, that's when I realized that it was really hard to be a vegetarian in Ward 8. Um, it was really hard to just get any type of food in general, um, let alone, you know, um, good quality like fruits and vegetables. Before we even get to food as medicine, let's talk about food as prevention. You know, making sure that we're consuming foods that have less, less salt, less added sugar, less saturated fat. These, you know, these nutrients are what we know lead to higher rates or put us at higher risk for chronic disease. So food could be medicine, but can, but before we get to that medicine, let's look at food as prevention and you know not wait till we need food as medicine to reverse these chronic diseases, but making sure that we're building balanced plates, um, you know, to prevent us from getting from getting to that point. Now, food as medicine, yes. So consuming foods that are nutrient dense that are um, they're nutrient dense that are low in salt, low in sugar, low in saturated fat can help roll back chronic disease. Now, medicine does play a role as well. So, you know, if you have been prescribed medicine, um, you working with your medical providers, that medicine plays a role, but food also can play a role too, um, and it can work together. So we want to make sure that we are looking at the foods that we're putting into our body, making sure that it's supporting our health, um, not only for ourselves, but especially if we're the gatekeepers of food in our family. So, you know, if we're managing a chronic disease, we are, you know, we should be taking in nutrient dense foods and preparing nutrient dense meals for ourselves. But we're also impacting those around us, those those other the other people who are in our household that may be relying on us. Um, for creating those meals? Um, food is kind of medicine. If you choose the right food, it's kind of helping your body to grow on and live longer, as I believe. So food is medicine, and this has become a more trendy term, right? Um, and I do believe you know food can play a role as medicine. Depending on the type of food you eat, it could prevent slow down or reverse chronic disease. And we talk about food as medicine a lot 
when it comes to diabetes management because the rates of diabetes are so high in our community. What we put in our bodies is how we nourish our body. Everything that you put in, we need it to be able to extract all the nutrients. If we put in harsh chemicals or processed foods, and I'm not even speaking from an acupuncture standpoint, I'm speaking from a personal stand, standpoint. Yes, food is definitely medicine. You know, um, a lot of times, you know, especially now during um, the pandemic and COVID, um, a lot of people feel as though they have to rely on, you know, a vaccine or, you know, different medications that are prescribed. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, judge anybody or tell anybody what to do with their health, but I do think that it's important for people to understand that food from the earth is the natural medicine. You know, so natural herbs, you know, things like sea moss, you know, things like different berries, a lot of, you know, just in general, like a lot of fruits and vegetables that come from the earth are the natural medicine. And, and, and I think that um, we focus more on building our immune systems from consuming those natural herbs and those natural fruits and vegetables from the earth. I think that we can become a, a much healthier um, community. I think community means that you're not really affected by something and that like when it comes to disease immunity means that your body has trained uh, and experienced the disease before so it knows what to do our immune system would naturally fight off any dis-ease it's important for us to know that so you're there's so many layers to our immune system right um, the, we, we like to think of it as a fortress. So you have your outer, your outer layers, right? You have your skin, your mucus, the things that are helping to aid in pathog preventing pathogens from getting into our body. Um, and then once you get into your body, there's so many different systems set into place to help boost our immune system. But there are things that we should be doing to aid in that, right? So that's where food can play a role. So having a well-balanced diet is gonna be our first step in boosting our immune system. And you know, boosting our immune system, helping to prevent chronic disease, so many, so many different roles. Having a balanced plate, incorporating those fruits and vegetables is going to be key. I think every country probably has food as medicine. However, my focus has been my African heritage culture and understanding how heritage can be our medicine, particularly how her heritage foods can be our medicine. And there are a number of what would be called African superfoods, um, like tiger nut, which is a very small little tuber that has now been used in everything from making chips to um, just snack foods or grinded um, historically in horchata, which has now been um, exchanged for rice because it's more, not only widely available, but it has been commoditized. So, um, but the tiger nut was called the tiger nut. Um, at least the myth is that it would help men become more viral. So it gives this belief that you will be strong like a tiger, hence tiger nut. Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of times we rely on different, you know, medications, you know, because it's a conditioning that we have um, in our community, you know, that we were raised to think that we're in pain or we had something like a headache or, you know, we feel nauseated that we have to run and go and get man-made prescribed, you know, medicine from the doctor or the, the stores, the CVS and things like that. But um, in reality, you know, food, natural food, you know, um, healthy food options, fruits, vegetables um, that come from the earth, as I mentioned before, are the natural medicines. We have to do our research and understand what some of the medicine we take are doing to our bodies. Have we done, what have we looked into it that far? Are we just listening to someone who's prescribing it for, um, for us? So I think if we start focusing more on a holistic diet and understanding what we're consuming, we'll be able to self-medicate ourselves. When we think about greens, uh, we have the collards, the, t the mustard, the turnip, 
the bitter leaf, um, the sweet potato leaf, so many different greens that are, have been made into soups and stews um, become a base of the pyramid when you think about our diet and how they're rich in calcium, magnesium, and vitamin C, um, but also they're strong in fiber content, which we have a fiber epidemic. We're not getting enough fiber, which kind of best way to describe operates like a broom in our guts, cleaning out any residue that needs to be gone um, in order for our systems to be fully functioning. And eating greens and the pot liquor juice because it is a water soluble vitamin in the greens is so really important. So find new ways to not only have good produce, but also preparation is critical, whether it's saute or if it's going to be baked, turned into like different green chips um, or just made into soups and stews, like making sure that you drink and eat the whole plant is so critically important because every part of the plant, just like every part of you matters and they matter in terms of connecting to who we are in order to function in this world um, and live out our purpose. So foods are a medicine and our heritage. Um, my opinion on this? My opinion on this is probably like, I don't know, actually. I can just look at the pictures and see like, I can, I can see that they're both sugar-y, but just in different forms. It's like they're sugar, like all candy or just, like soda related things is like just sugar but it's in a different form it means that i'm taking years off the life of my of my organs by making them work really hard to process something that doesn't really belong there drinks like sorrel um, or sobolo or zoo it has many different names bisop depending on what community you're in um, is made from the Roselle hibiscus flower and it is a very dark, almost burgundy looking color. Um, and so when you make the drink, um, people will bend, blend all sorts of spices like, you know, you could do cinnamon or clove along with sweeten it with pineapple or strawberries or oranges, whichever. Um, and sometimes um, ginger may be added but the idea behind the drink is that it has this uh, ability to lower blood pressure. A study has been done um, looking over a six week span of time with just a cup um, of hibiscus a day and showing how um, it reduced blood pressure in the population being studied. The hibiscus flower um, because it to me is linked not only to the heart of our people, but to the heritage of us and how our heritage truly can be our medicine. Um, and so for heart disease being number one, not only in America and women and black Americans, my family um, having heart stroke, coronary heart disease um, history, um, I'm super mindful of foods that speak to um, heart health. And I'm sure that people like candy because of how it tastes, but it is bad for your teeth. And like, I don't want to go to the dentist a million times because I'm eating candy. And like, if candy, if we could still eat candy, just make it like more or less sugary. Cause sometimes I question some things are like, like why is our cavities a thing? And why is candy so sugary and make you have cavities, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I do think you eat certain foods consistently, they can destroy your body. And adversely, if you eat, you know, healthy foods consistently, it builds up your body. So yes, absolutely. Um, I know like with the, with the virus, they're talking about all types of elderberry, uh, uh, apple cider, vinegar, like it's all types of things you can do to keep your immune system up and take care of your body. That's natural, you know, so absolutely. Did you know you can find all of that at the Fresh Food Factory market? I, I'm going to Fresh Food Factory Market. I'm, I'm going, you know what, I'm going this upcoming <laughs> week. I will be there.
I will be there. I'm gonna go check it out. I keep saying I'm gonna go. I've been making excuses. I no longer have excuses. I'm going. It is said that food influences our responses and our behaviors. So, is food a drug? Now, food as a drug, that's actually that's actually a, a different way to look at it. But, you know, when we do consume in, in more frequency or higher frequency um, foods that contain, you know, higher levels of sodium, foods that contain, you know, added sugar um, in abundance, foods that contain high amounts of saturated fat, we are training our taste buds and our hormonal response to, to desire those foods, right? Food can have an addictive um, side to it. We, we could take that one or two different ways. You know, you think you're having a craving, it's really your body speaking to you saying, hey, I'm low on magnesium. I'm low on vitamin B. So the thing that, um, that's in that so you might eat a lot of oranges you're like i don't know why i'm eating all of these oranges but you could be low on vitamin c vitamin b or whatever's in that orange so in that way that's kind of like that drug fixing the thing that you're lacking your body rewards you for giving it things that help it to thrive so the more you eat your fruits and veggies the more you eat those whole grains the more you you know practice mindfulness when it comes to food slowing down and paying attention to your food enjoying that moment with the food um the the more you will be able to kind of tap in to understanding your body's needs if we put in foods that are hard to process that means that every organ in our body has to work over time to process and eliminate all the bad nutrients so why would we put something it's like why would you put bad gas in your car and you gotta drive 500 miles just to drive it out so you can put good gas in your car and your car can start running correctly so my thing is what you put in your body is what you see out you get it in your skin you have it in your complexion you have it in your thoughts your mind could be foggy if you have bad food it's in your joints in your weight in in, in even in your hair being healthy i use the example of after you eat a pack of oreo cookies right it tasted good in the moment your brain was telling you you wanted it but your body is going to reject it. Um, your body, you know, your body is gonna speak to you in a way that you have to listen to, and it tells you what it what it actually needs, what it actually would actually taste good to your body, and maybe not your brain. So we have to. It takes practice to tap into that, and that's what we call mindful eating. Um, but that can help combat this kind of, you know, that can help combat the addictive side of food, the feeling of feeling uncontrolled around food. Um, and it can also move us away from looking at foods as good and bad because foods don't really have a moral component to them. Um, you know, all foods fit, but it's, you know, for me, I always speak all about how, how much and how often, you know, we consume those foods that may, may not, um, may not be as healthy-ish as others. But the other end of the spectrum where some people, um, eat food because of some, it could be some mental fatigue and they're eating to you know suppress that thing that they that they're bothered about like alcoholism uh i think one thing uh one facet that may be contributing to the problem is um, a lack of uh, um, a lack of stores that are providing what the community really needs uh, we have a lot of liquor stores around here, um, and those stores, they sell a lot of alcohol, and they sell a lot of junk food. And, and, and these are areas where there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of drug use, there's a lot of alcoholism, there's a lot of valid crime, and yet we continue to allow these stores to be there. And we don't have fresh food stores. I think you are what you eat, you know, um, if you're eating a piece, you subsequently can have characteristics of a beast. And the other thing about how it can be a drug, think about this. We take pharmaceuticals to help us get rid of ailments or diseases. 
So I think we gotta understand that the pharmaceutical industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, you know, and that industry thrives off people being sick. So I think that we have to take a look at that and understand that, you know, the systems and processes that are put to, in place for us to so-called heal aren't necessarily healing us. We are the natural healers. I feel like we can heal ourselves through a natural, holistic diet, veggie first. You know, put, incorporate your, your fruits, your veggies, your, your, you know, and those things in your diet. You know what I mean? Instead of waking up eating bacon, eggs, how about we do a shake with natural fruits um, and things like that. Instead of drinking milk that comes from a cow, how about we, you know, substitute um, that with almond milk or oat milk and things like that. So I think we got to be really um, careful when we start, you know, worshiping these businesses that are thriving off of us, especially in our community, being sick and start healing ourselves. So if you eat the proper food, it can be a drug to help you control diabetes, help you control blood pressure, help you control your heart condition. So yeah, food can be a drug. My name is Aiden, and today I'll be talking about people who changed healthcare and food culture forever. For an example, here's Charles Drew. He discovered blood plasma, and he learned to distribute the plasma to different parts of the body and to different bodies to save lives. Today, the power of plasma is still used in major surgeries and plastic surgeries all over the world. Thank you, Charles Drew, for this amazing discovery. Prior to COVID-19, food access and education were deemed to be a problem, but now we truly see that they are pandemic. But we've survived pandemics before. We've survived the Spanish flu. We've survived other catastrophes like tsunamis, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, famines, and floods. But we need to get it right this time. We need to make sure that people not only survive, but they learn through this and that we all thrive through this so everyone can have equal access and opportunity. You know, if we have a healthier immune system because we have a healthy regimen, we're better able to, you know, fight off the virus and, um, you know, move forward. As I say, we might have some underlying conditions later, um, but generally, if you have a healthy immune system, you're able to fight it all, as opposed to those who are more at high risk. I I don't I just want to know how it started, like not how you telling me like maybe that's true. But I want to know like how is it as a fact or like not like a prediction. I just want to know it as a fact. So if something were to emerge later on, I know. <laughs> something happens and I have to be shut down in the house, I'm gonna have what I need in order to survive. And everybody doesn't have that luxury. So like, how can we make sure that others have the things that they need to survive if something else, you know, happens? We should show the elders, the children, everyone should be involved. And where does our food come from? How do we produce food? How can I produce some food for myself? How can I produce herbs? You don't have to grow a lot of food, but how can I barter with my neighbors and trade this food for that food? How can I, when I go to the grocery store, what am I looking for in a product? Move the fast food stores further out. I mean, I know it's cheaper. We feel like that's better for us. Move those a little bit further out, more healthy grocery stores, more access to, to food that can help our bodies. Liquor stores, move them out. That that would be my wish for, for our community. And just more access to healthy food. So like uh, the Fresh Food Factory, like more access to those type of things. Now you are in the driver's seat. We hope that Feed Ward 8 drives you to change and to share your stories. Capture your insights, actions, and impact and send them to our team. Like us, follow us, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell, and DM us videos and screenshots of the change that you are making for yourselves, your family, and the community. 
we want to show everyone around the world that you have taken action towards a new and inclusive DC food culture. The person with the most engagements and creates the most positive change by Tuesday, April 27, 2021, will be honored as our community hero or shero. The renowned portrait artist Luis Peralta del Valle will paint an image in your likeness and it will be hung at the Fresh Food Factory's market alongside other heroes and sheroes for all to see.